Dr. Yehuru Williams received his PhD in history from Howard University. Today, he is the chair of the Department of History and the director of Black Studies at Fairfield University. Dr. Williams has published numerous books, including Teaching Beyond the Textbook, The Souls of Black Folk, and The Color Line Revisited. He recently appeared in the LA Progressive in an article entitled AstroTurf Activism and Corporate Education Reform, a detailed critique of the privatization forces at work in Philadelphia. I first came to know of Dr. Williams this past summer when I listened to a speech he gave to the badass teachers in Washington, D.C. His talk touched me very deeply, and I left feeling that this man had a profound understanding of the struggles we're experiencing here, and that he had a great deal to teach us. I immediately sent an email to him, and when he replied, I learned that while Dr. Williams teaches in Connecticut, he actually lives rather close to us here in New Jersey. And so we begin this work today with a word of inspiration from our good neighbor from across the bridge. Please join me in a warm welcome to Dr. Yibiru Williams. Today? Try that again. How are all of you today? Much, much better. I am going to do two things. I want to give you somewhat of a formal presentation, then I want to transition to a PowerPoint show. Then I want to bring some folks up who've joined me from the badass teachers. Feel strange saying that in the church, but when you're doing God's work, then you should be able to say badass teachers. <laughs> all right. Amen? Amen. So let me briefly outline what I want to share with you this morning. First and foremost, I want to be clear. We have the power to transform education. I want to be clear because our schools are not failing. It is our democracy that is failing. And we need to address and correct that if we're going to be successful in our endeavors to preserve public education. Despite the rhetoric of the corporate education reformers, school reform is not the great civil rights issue of our time. Eradicating poverty, which has contributed mightily to the conditions in our schools and communities is the great civil rights issue of our time. Mm -hmm. This is where our collective energies should lie. I would also like to say to you, and I'm glad to be in Philadelphia to share this, that we are in the midst of a great social revolution in America, in fact, in the world. Simply look to the East and pro-democracy rallies in China and the Middle East, and you see that we are in the context of a global challenge to these types of initiatives. But the problem is, while we suffer under the delusion that our democracy is well, it has never been in greater jeopardy. When you look at the School Reform Commission here in the city of Philadelphia, when you consider the fact that politicians are more beholden to the paychecks of the Koch brothers and Alec than they are responsive to the voices of the people, we need to make sure that our democracy will survive in the 21st century for our young people. And so we are here not only to do triage, but to do major surgery and reclaim our democracy for the future. So I say to you on this occasion, congratulations, Philadelphia. You sent a message to the education reformers that our democracy is viable. First you took to the streets, and then you took to the polls to reward your former governor's faithfulness, faithlessness on education <laughs> with a vote of no confidence. Your impudence inspired me to poetry. It's not very good, but I will share it anyway. <laughs> Farewell, Tom Corbett. The people let you know. When you undermine our schools, it's time for you to go. <laughs> Welcome, Governor Wolf. Your promises brought relief, but to ensure you're just not another wolf in sheep's clothing, we plan to keep you on a short leash. <laughs> poetic, poetic justice aside, we can no longer afford to place such unbridled faith in politicians to protect our future. All right. We must get back to basics. 
We must first reclaim our democracy if we ever have a hope in reclaiming our schools. One of the things that I love most about the Caucus of Working Educators is the fact that it begins with we. We as, former, uh, we, as a former high school social studies teacher and passionate defender of music and arts in the curriculum, I love both the lyrical and rhetorical substance of we. We meaning you and I, meaning they and not us, meaning we the people. You cannot get more foundational than the aspirational language found in the preamble of the Constitution, a language that this body is right to appropriate as it seeks to transform politics. For the original preamble was written to address the age of the Enlightenment and what we need is a new age of Enlightenment and a revised preamble that speaks to the great issues of our time. What I love again about the Congress of, or Caucus of Working Educators is that we are addressing one of the problems that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King talked about in his lifetime. Rarely do we find men who are willingly engaged in hard, solid thinking. There's almost a universal quest for easy answers and half-baked solutions. That is what corporate education reform is. Easy answers and half-baked solutions. Not an intent to eradicate poverty, to look to the issues that divide us, to deal with the problems that are affecting our children and our students in ways that ultimately not only threaten their future, but our collective existence as a democracy, as a republic. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King continued, nothing pains some people more than having to think. Today is about thinking, but it's not just about thinking, it's also about action. Because at the end of the day, what we hope is that people will be inspired to do more than talk about the issues, but actually to actively engage in solutions that will bring about a change to our present condition. When I think about the ca caucus of working educators in the preamble, I think we could rewrite that preamble in this way. You could say this with me. Working educators, in order to preserve our what? Union. Mm -hmm. Restore. Justice. Regain. Domestic tranquility. Redefine. The common defense. Promote the people's welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and prosperity. Declare our intention to fight for our souls. That's our preamble. I both love and hate this image. It reminds me of the hope and change we thought we were going to get in 2008. It reminds me that the corporate education reformers are so insidious to appropriate the history and the language of the struggle for civil rights for their profitizing and privatization schemes. It shows Barack Obama sitting at the front of the bus, and it's meant to approximate two major episodes in the history of civil rights in this country. Rosa Parks, but what kind of bus is it? Because it was both Rosa Parks' act of defiance and Brown versus Board of Education that historians typically locate the civil rights movement in. And yet, race to the top, like no child left behind before, has done more to promote segregation and inequality than to move us forward in our quest for racial equality and economic justice. We look at this image, and it reminds me of Thurgood Marshall, who, in the aftermath of Brown, laid out his vision of education. What Marshall said is, look, education is not teaching of the three R's. It's not about reading, writing, and arithmetic. Education, he said, is the teaching of overall citizenship, to learn to live together with fellow, fellow citizens, and above all, to learn to obey the law. I do not know of any more horrible destruction of the principle of citizenship than to tell young people in Little Rock that those of you who withdrew rather than go to school with Negroes come back, all is forgiven. I don't know of any greater disservice to democracy than to say to the school reform board, to the politicians in Philadelphia, that you can abrogate a contract, you can undermine democracy, you can disobey the law, and come back, all is forgiven. No, all is not forgiven. This is about democracy. This is about justice. The corporate ed deformers, Arnie Duncan and John King and Michelle Reed, are so comfortable trading in this language. And what they fail to realize, and the bats are, are, are proud of talking about this, is that unlike their agenda, we privilege three things. Number one, people over profits. Number two, parity over charity. And number three, choice over chance. 
So our vision of education is very different than their vision of education. When they talk about civil rights as being the great revolution of our time, what they fail to appreciate is that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King never would have agreed with their corporate education reform agenda. Now, how can you prove that, Dr. Williams? Because Arne Dunn just gave a speech three months ago where he talked about how the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King would have supported everything that he and Michelle Reed and John King and all these other clowns, excuse me, not <laughs> church, but clowns, <laughs> are promoting. In 1947, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, while still an undergraduate at Morehouse College, wrote a piece. I'm going to share with you that piece because there are elements of it that answer the question, what would Martin think about corporate education reform? What would Martin think about what's happening in Philadelphia? What would Martin think about what's happening in Ohio? What would Martin think about what's happening in New York? What would Martin think about what's happening in Kansas and in California? Martin's going to tell you. He began that essay, I too often find that most college men have a misconception of the purpose of education. Most of the brethren think that education should equip them with the proper instruments of exploitation. so that they can trample forever over the masses. Still others think that education should furnish them with noble ends rather than a means to an end. I think it's pretty clear what side we're on and what side our opponents are on. Martin Luther King continued, it seems to me that education has a twofold function to perform in the life of man and society. The one is utility and the other is culture. Now let's be clear, we're in a church. I feel like I'm going to start preaching up in here. I apologize if I do, but hey, it's the video. I can't help it. <laughs> you say in the arts that you are not promoting culture. If you are not, if you do not have a vision. If you do not have a range of academic interventions that allow students to express themselves in all ways, then you are not promoting culture. You cannot learn culture from filling out bubbles on a standardized test. by drawing murals than they will pre them preparing for a standardized test. We need to get back to that. This city is, is known for that. King continues, I love this. Education must enable a man to become more efficient to achieve with increasing facility the legitimate goals of his life. But education must also train one for quick, resolute, and effective thinking. To think incisively and to think for oneself is very difficult. We are prone to let our mental life become invaded by legions of half-truths prejudices, and propagandas. I'd like to send that to Arnie Dunn. <laughs> and your mayors. And your former governor. At this point, I wonder whether or not education is fulfilling its purpose. Now, I want to be clear. King is not making the argument that the corporate education reformers make about we need to privatize our schools because they're failing, because our students aren't perform performing well on high-stakes tests. King is saying we're failing because we're not contemplating on the great social issues of our day that could move us forward as a society and a culture. Watch this. King continues. A great majority of the so-called educated people do not think logically and scientifically. It was interesting that there was a poll that came out that showed that most people didn't hold teachers responsible for the debacle that took place here, and yet Tom Corbett got on television and kept saying, it's the teachers union that's responsible, as if people aren't smart enough to read up. <laughs> Even the press, the classroom, the platform, and the pulpit, in many instances, do not give objective and unbiased truths. Think about the collection of ministers and politicians, pundits, from all walks of life, who've signed on and supported corporate education reform? Who, marginal reality here, have put their agencies behind this poison of privatization? To save man from the morass of propaganda, in my opinion, is one of the chief aims of education. Education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence, to discern the truth from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from the fiction. The caucus of working educators is doing that here in Philadelphia. The badass teachers are doing that across the country. We are doing that across the country. But we have to do it independent 
of those traditional avenues which were available to us because they had been poisoned and corrupted. I was in Boston a few months ago for the Barack Obama and American Democracy Conference. Excuse me while I laugh. <laughs> And one of the ladies came up and she said, I work for a group and we're doing outreach to prisoners. And I said, that is wonderful. And she said, we'd love to have you speak. And I said, that's great, I'd love to do it. And she said, we'll be able to offer you a small honorarium. And I said, I would simply donate it back to you. And she says, well, don't worry about it. We're financed by the Cobra. Oh. <laughs> the function of education can continue, therefore, is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. But education which stops with efficiency may prove the greatest menace to society. Do you hear me, test takers? The most dangerous criminal may be the man gifted with reason, but with no more. talk about Eugene Talmadge, who was governor of Georgia at that time, and King says all these wonderful things about Talmadge. He makes him sound like Arne Duncan and all these people with these billions of dollars and, and, and Ivy League degrees who want to pontificate about where we should be with regard to our schools, who want to come on television and smile at us in pretty suits and tell us about how privatization is going to save our kids, who sell us on the idea that charters, barters, and TFA martyrs are ultimately going to move this forward because untrained teachers in the classroom is the solution <laughs> King says about Talmadge, by all measures, Mr. Talmadge could think critically and intensively, yet he contends that I'm an inferior being. Are those the types of men we call educated? Let me be clear. King says, we must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education. Of course, we don't have time for character education anymore. We're prepping for tests. The complete education gives one not only the power of concentration, but I want to emphasize this, tweet it, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. What worthy objective comes from concentrating on how one will perform simply on a test? King concludes, the broad education will therefore transmit to one not only the accumulated knowledge of the race, but also the accumulated experience of social living. I want to go back because he says, if we're not careful, our colleges will produce a group of closed-minded, unscientific, illogical propagandists. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. He said in 1947, where are we today? These are some of the best trained, best educated, best equipped, best financed minds in the country. King continues, consume with them moral acts. Be careful, brethren. Be careful, teachers. Look at the corporate education reform industry and its lackeys, because they resemble exactly what the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King described. They come from both sides of the political aisle, liberal and neoliberal conservative. They mix up the same Kool-Aid. Our schools are in crisis. American students lag behind the rest of the world. They need curriculum rooted in STEM in order to be competitive. We say this in bats. We don't want to compete with the rest of the world. We want to work with the rest of the world. We want to heal the world. Competition created the Cold War. Competition fed Osama bin Laden. Competition ends up creating those conditions that force us to go to war because we can't make peace, because we're too busy worrying about competing. I'm sorry. Our schools and teachers are inadequate, made so by tenure and powerful teaching unions that shield bad teachers and reduce accountability. It's hard not to laugh about that one because the fact of the matter is you wouldn't have had a civil rights movement if it wasn't for unions. Unions were the backbone of the civil rights movement. The reason why unions function so effectively or, or that unions were so effective in that capacity is because they allowed people to act without fear of being arbitrarily dismissed for their political activism. But they twist the history in such a way now to make it appear that somehow unions are the great enemy of people. Got to continue. Sorry. 
When King talks about creating a moral propaganda, I just got to step back. I'm not calling the brother immoral. I'm just saying. Arnie Duncan, Brooklyn, 2009. We should be able to look every second grader in the eye and say, you're on track, you're going to be able to go to college, or you're not. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think a look at what's in back here, too. What's been erased from our school? Libraries, counselors, class sizes. I remember another came on and said, we reduced the number of building teams, building building teams. We've got it down. We're not at capacity. So the reason why you had those buildings, we needed those buildings because we need small class sizes. Yeah. Because <laughs> because they can shed light on what would make this work. But you're not listening to us. We want safe learning conditions, recess, nurses. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need computers. These people say, online education. Thank you, Chester Charter, for pointing out how online education can actually become an agent of segregation. <laughs> I'm sorry. Watch this. Governor Dan Malloy from my state of Connecticut. I don't mind teaching to the test as long as the test scores go up. Therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem. That's where you get the cheating. The repeating. The deleting. The misleading. Guys, I don't have to tell you. You're here. Corporate education reform is literally killing us. You know what happened here in Philadelphia because we don't have nurses in our schools. But even at the university level, where we have people who are working under adjunct contracts, contingent faculties making $3,000 a course with no health care, 83 year old woman right here in Pennsylvania died. 83 years old, Duquesne University, whose president is a foremost expert on health care, health care and law and policy. And yet one of your faculty members drops dead in her driveway of a heart attack at 83 because you stripped her of the three courses she was teaching at $3,000 a year down to one course. So she couldn't pay her heat or hot water or her lights. And then you tell us that education is the great civil rights of our time and we want to ensure kids can go to college. And yet even in our colleges and universities, we're undermining basic human rights, basic social justice. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said it best in 1967 in his final book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, when he said, we made a big mistake in the civil rights movement by simply talking about opportunity. We should have been talking about economic justice. Because let's be clear, what good is it to have a right to eat in a restaurant if you can't afford anything on the menu? Civil rights without economic justice are dead rights. What good is it to have a right to go to college if you can't afford tuition? Civil rights without economic justice is well, it's unequal, inherently. Therein lies the problem. But they drink the Kool-Aid. They persist in the Kool-Aid. They love the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to do this. I know I'm running out of time. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King also commented on the And I know some of you want to say, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in 1956 Talk about technology and its appropriate use in learning. This is what he said. Now as we face the fact of this new emerging world, we must face the responsibilities that come along with it. Not the competition, the responsibilities. I love this. A new age brings with it new challenges. Let's consider some of the challenges of this new age. First, we are challenged to rise above the narrow confines of our individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all what? Humanity. Because see, I love, you can clap for the Reverend Dr. now. <laughs> because we know Twitter contributed to the era of spring. That's an effective use and innovative use of technology in helping people share information that ultimately helped to deepen and create opportunities for them to express their discontent with the government that did not meet their needs. That is a celebration of technology we can all get behind. The new world, he continues, is a world of geographical togetherness. I want you to think about this, because this is 1956. So he's, there's no internet. It took six hours to fly from New York. This is not the world that we live in where we have instant communication, and yet King, even in 1956, recognized 
the importance of all these things. He continues, this means that no individual or nation can live alone. We must all learn to live together or we will be forced to die together. This new world of geographical togetherness has been brought about to a great extent by man's scientific and technological genius. Man through his scientific genius has been able to dwarf distance and place time and change. He's been able to carve highways through the stratosphere. And yet, in our moment, rather than using that as a means to help our students who are struggling with ELL, rather than using that as an opportunity to say that we can slow down the year and offer a range of academic interventions that are organic to where our students are, rather than using those and employing those technologies in a way that help to deepen our students' understanding of math and science and technology and engineering, rather than forcing us to come up with ridiculous acronyms like STEAM <laughs> and system, social studies and huge science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It, it's not supposed to be that they're supposed to work in concert. It is the essence of a liberal arts education. It is cure personalis, care the whole person. That is what we are involved in. That is the nature of our endeavor. That is where education comes from. That is what was born in, in the enlightenment. That is what fertilizes it. Everything else is crap. And I said it in a church. <laughs> and it's on tape. <laughs> Guys, I say to you soberly that we find ourselves in the midst of a revolution. But what does that mean exactly? In his book, Six Years That Shook the World, W.R. Cause calls us to remember that revolutions are not simple affairs that are easily concluded. They are long, traumatic affairs that tear apart societies and inflict change on a scale unanticipated at the time leading up to the revolution. And the question for all of us is if we're willing to pay the call. Powerful thing about that is that here in Philadelphia, the revolution has been going on since 1981, since that great effort to undermine the teacher. This is the cradle of liberty. It is the birthplace of America. It's interesting when we talk about the civil rights movement because you can't escape Philadelphia. You'll talk about it in the American Revolution. You talk about it during the civil rights movement. We talk about, well, Philadelphia, Mississippi is where they found those three civil rights workers, Ferber, Jane, and Goodman, which led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which if Pennsylvania had not supported, I mean, you can do the work. But now we come to 2014, and we see students of color out in the streets we see teachers out in the streets demanding for a just democracy, contending for a just democracy, and we have to take a step back and say, what the hell did we mean when we said that these truths we hold to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their favorite with certain inalienable rights, among these are life, liberty, and a pursuit not of Adam, <laughs> not of property, but of happiness. Now, how do we define that? Not the way that the Koch brothers do with Eli Ward does. But the way that we, we, this is our lives. This is our city. This is our country. These are our children. This is our world. Either we stand and claim it, and we fight for it, or we retreat, and we allow it to In China, they had this up, and it spoke to me. They said they can't kill us all in China. But here in the United States, they silence us with such a... They can't silence us all. They can't hide what's happening here. It's funny because when I look at the Congress, uh, I'm sorry, the caucus, I always want to call you guys the Congress. Maybe it's the Philadelphia thing. Maybe it's the, all the conversation about democracy that gets me worked up. But I'm telling you, that's what I want to call you. I don't want to call you that because I think the work is important. Because I wish I was here on a daily basis to work with you. Because I believe that, and I'm going to be very clear, Philadelphia is the canary in the mind as Philly goes. So the Social Studies identifies core democratic values for elementary students. This is funny. This is what the National Council for Social Studies says. We should be teaching elementary students. I got to go through this. It's great. Number one, life. Each citizen has a right to the protection of their life. Not Alec and stand your ground laws. That's not what we're talking about. 
but life meaning the opportunity to have an education that meets the need of those communities. Liberty, I'm sorry, the pursuit of happiness. Each citizen can find happiness in their own way as long as they do not infringe on the rights of others. Liberty, I love this. Liberty includes the freedom to believe what you want, freedom to choose your own friends, to express your ideas and opinions in public, the right for people to meet in groups. Ha ha. <laughs> and the right to have a lawful job or business and a union to support you in it. People should be treated fairly in getting advantages and disadvantages of the country. Popular sovereignty. Really? For third graders? Absolutely. What does it mean? The power of the government comes from who? The people. And we are the? People. Truth. The government and citizens should not lie. Somewhere the earth is moving. <laughs> Common good. Citizens should work together for the good of all. The government should make laws that are good for everyone. Hear that, Alex? <laughs> Equality, everyone should be treated the same. Diversity, difference in language, race, religion, dress, food, and heritage are not only allowed but accepted as important, which means that if we're disregarding our non-English speakers, then we should think real hard about what it means to be part of a democracy if we're going to pretend that that's not an issue in the range of ways that affects non-English speakers beyond the black and white divide. Thanks. Patriotism, a devotion to our country and our core democratic values. If I look at we, it's interesting, um, member-driven union, we work to respond, represent, and amplify the voice of our members. It goes back to these core democratic values, transparency, accountability, shared decision, defense of 